I like to ask whether or not you have goals, but I want to ask you another question. How many of you know that if you had your life to live over again, you could do more than what you've done thus far? Raise your hands, please. Now, that proves a point that what we do and what we accomplish in life is only a tip of the iceberg of what's possible for us. So I want you to think about some goals that you'd like to achieve, and I'd like for you to, let's say, break them up in three categories. Number one, I want you to think about some personal goal you'd like to achieve. And I'd like for you to think about some career goal, some business goal that you'd like to achieve. And I want you to think about some social contribution, some impact you'd like to make with your life. It was Horace Mann who said, we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind. I believe we live in the greatest country in the world that gives us an opportunity to leave our mark, to make a statement with our lives. And as you think about these goals, whatever those goals are, I want you to dramatically increase those goals. And I want to warn you, I don't want you to think about how you're going to do it. How is none of your business. The most important thing is just to increase those goals dramatically. I've found that most people fail in life, not because they aim too high and miss. Most people fail in life because they aim too low and hit. And many don't aim at all. So raise the bar on yourself and don't ask how you're doing, how you're going to do it. I'll never forget when I decided that I wanted to become a motivational speaker. I saw the, the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and, and my heart said, I can do that. But my mind asked the question, how? And for over 14 years, for 14 years, I would go see Zig Ziglar and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and Jim Rohn and different speakers and I would be in the audience and, and my heart would pounce and say, you can do that, you can do that, Les. And then when I would leave, I would be going to the parking lot and my mind said, how are you going to do it? And I spent so many years trying to figure out how. I wasted 14 years. How many of you ever procrastinated? Raise your hands, please. Yeah, see, so, so as you begin to think about your goals, the most important thing is, and write this down, commit yourself. See, once you commit yourself, the how will come. The way will come. Once you commit yourself, you will then figure it out. And if you're going in the wrong direction, all you have to do is turn around and go in the other direction. You will figure it out. You want to begin to just challenge yourself. You want to stretch yourself because you really don't know what you can't do. I never forget the first day that I met Mr. Washington. I, I was born in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City. I was born in an abandoned building on a floor with a twin brother. And when we were six weeks of age, we were adopted. And when I was in the fifth grade, I was identified as EMR, labeled educable, mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. And I failed again when I was in the eighth grade. I don't have any college education, but because of my mother, and I feel like Abraham Lincoln who said, all that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. I saw a sign once that said that God took me from my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. So my first major goal was to buy my mother a home, to take care of my mother. And, and I did that, took care of her until she passed at 88. But I'll never forget when I met Mr. Washington, I was in a class waiting on another student, and, and he came in and he said, young man, go to the board and work this problem out for us. I said, oh, sir, I, I can't do that. He said, why? I said, I'm not one of you students. He said, look at me. I said, yes, sir. Go to the board and work the problem out anyhow. I said, sir, I, I can't do what you're asking me to do. He said, why? Sir, because I'm, I'm educable, mentally retarded, sir. And as the students erupted in laughter, he came from behind his desk. He looked at me and he said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And that was a turning point in my life. On one hand, I was humiliated. But on the other hand, I was liberated because he looked at me with the eyes of Goethe who said, look at a man the way that he is. He only becomes worse, but look at him as if he were what he could be. Then he becomes what he should be. And so Mr. Washington, he challenged me. And I want to challenge you right now about raising your goals. And, and I want you to shake someone's hand on your right and left, look him in the eyes and say, stretch yourself. Yeah, see, see, I think that, that you really have to stretch yourself to discover your stuff. I think that we have to really begin to experiment with life. And I said that you have something special. I didn't say that just to be kind of courteous. You do. See, I think that 
there are not many people that come to seminars or workshops or will watch a program of this nature. Why? I just think that most people are just satisfied to where they are. I'm, I'm reminded of a man one day, he was walking down the street and he passed his porch where some people were on the porch talking and there was a dog moaning and groaning. And he was curious why the dog was moaning and groaning. And he, he went back and he said, um, excuse me, he asked the owner, why is the dog moaning and groaning? The guy said, because he's laying on a nail. He said, well, why won't he get off? He said, it's not hurting bad enough for him to get off. Just hurting bad enough to moan and groan. How many of you know people who should be here? Raise your hands, please. How many of you know people, all they do is moan and groan? Raise your hands. <laughs> moan and groan. I, I, I'm not making enough money. Moan and groan. I, I'm, I'm unhappy with my job. 87% of people go to jobs that they hate. And in, in addition to that, you know, the, as we know that, that we have the dubious distinction in this country that on, on Monday morning, the heart attack rate increases over 35%. On Monday morning between 6 o'clock and 9, people going to jobs that they hate. The heart said, didn't I tell you I didn't want to go? And attack them. <laughs> Some of you don't want to go to work next Monday. <laughs> so the thing is this. So you want to find out what resonates with you. What is it you really want to do? You want to experiment with life and find out what fits for you. You have something special. You have greatness within you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. See, I believe that anybody through observation and practice can perform at the level of excellence. But when you're pursuing your greatness, and this is worth writing down, you don't know what your limits are, and you act like you don't have any. So I say to you, you have something special. You have greatness within you. And, and I want to make four things clear. Number one, everything that I'm going to say, you already know it. If what I share, the message that, that I'm going to express right now and share with you, if it wasn't a part of who you are already, you wouldn't be in the audience. That's number one. That's, not, that's very important. It's already in you. I'm going to only confirm and validate that which is a part of you anyhow. The second thing is everything I'm going to say to you, you've heard it before from people with college degrees and credentials I can't hold a candle to. It's common sense, but not common practice. Third thing is, I don't want you to agree with me, and I don't want you to believe me. I just want you to be open to some things right now. I want you to think beyond that which is commonly allowed. And I'm gonna tell you what I'm up to. I want you to think about your goals, and I wanna tell you what I'm gonna do right now. My whole goal is to get past your mind. That's my whole challenge, and there's nothing you can do about it. I'm going to do that. See, your assignment was to show up. My assignment is to get past your mind and get into your heart. Once you think about the goals that you want to achieve, and I really want to challenge you to make up your mind that you're going to make that happen for yourself. And I hope that it's some goal that, that really resonates with who you are. When I was a little boy, my goal was to, to just buy groceries for our family. My mother worked on Miami Beach. She was a domestic worker. And, and my goal was to, to really be able to go to the grocery store and purchase groceries ourselves. The families knew that my mother had adopted seven children. And so they said, Mamie, whatever food is left over after we eat, you can take that home to the children. They were very kind, very, very considerate people. The mother, my mother, who when she worked on Miami Beach, the people were very kind. I was appreciative of their generosity. But as a little boy, I said, Mama, one day, when I become a big boy, I'm going to be able to provide groceries for us. My goal as a little boy was to buy clothes for my brothers and sisters. We wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that Mama babysat for when she went over in Miami Beach. And if the clothes were too small, she would let them out. And if they were too large, Mama could sew and take them up. And I'll never forget um, David Sadursky. His father was very wealthy. Mama worked for him. But David was my buddy. And so... His father gave him two gifts for his birthday. Gave him uh, a, a brand new boat, but he also gave him some motivational tapes. Earl Nightingale, I'm, I'll never forget. So he said, David, man, let me tell you something. When, when I die, you, you're going to get everything. I want you to listen to these tapes. And when his father left the room, David threw those tapes in the wastebasket. I said, David, could I have those tapes? He said, yes. I said, man, your father said, if you listen to these, you, you can get more and do more than what he's done. He said, hey, look, I'm going to get everything anyhow. Go ahead, take them. 
I thought I told my children, I'm not leaving them anything. You know, if I had a quarter and thought I was going to die, I'd swallow it. <laughs> Write this down. It's not what you leave for your children, it's what you leave in them. Not what you leave for them, what you leave in them. No, absolutely not. I'll tell you something else happened. I never forget. Mama came home one day and said, Leslie, David sent you a new pair of shoes his father got for him. I said, oh, Mama, thank you so much. I can't wear David's shoes. I said, why? Well, you tell my buddy that, you know, I wear size nine and a half. He wears size nine. She said, boys, shut up, sit down, and put those shoes on. She said, Margaret go get some Vaseline. And she came in there, and my sister started rubbing the Vaseline on my feet. And she said, run some water in the bathtub. And she's not going there and, and, and put your feet in those shoes and don't mash the heel down. I said, Mama, don't, get, shut up, boy, don't mash the heel down. And then she had me to get in the bathtub. I said, Mama, these shoes hurt. She said, get in there and walk around in the water. And I'm walking around the bathtub. Then she tried to distract me. I knew what she was doing. How'd you do at school today? I did good. Did you get in any fights? No, ma'am. You know you fought somebody. Well, I only hit three people today. <laughs> and, and then after a while, she said, how are you doing? I said, well, they hurt. Do they hurt as bad as they were before? No, ma'am, they feel a little bit better. Keep on walking, keep on walking. And then after a while, when the leather soaked up the water, the leather began to stretch to a perfect nine and a half. You think Fortune 500 companies started talking about doing more with less? My mother been doing that for a long time. It's amazing what you can do. But who would have thought, anybody looking in on this kid and these seven children, who would have thought? And I look at you and I say, you have greatness within you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. No one could have convinced me that I would be doing what I'm doing right now. You know, the easiest thing I do every year is, is go into a sales organization and dramatically increase their sales or go into a prison and, and enable prisoners to see themselves differently and teach them the methods and techniques of how to plug into the system or motivate young people to begin to to see how they can have a vision of themselves in the future and fit that's the easiest thing i do to, or train a speaker to help them to leverage their experience as a speaker and say look speaking is a projection of who you are not who you think you ought to be and come with power from a platform. That's the easiest thing I've ever done. Let me share with you the most difficult thing I've ever done. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do what I'm now doing. No one could have convinced me, just given my circumstances, I earn millions of dollars every year. No one could have convinced me. If, if both my parents came up here right now, I, I would not know either one. No one could have convinced me, being labeled educable, mentally retarded, born in an abandoned building of floor in Liberty City, poor section of Miami, Florida, failing twice in school, no college training, never worked for a major corporation. I did not know. I can do what I'm doing right now. I'll never forget Mike Williams, my mentor. One, I think a lot of people fail in life because of the fact that they need some mentoring. They need some coaching. Uh, repeat out to me, please. You need, you need some coaching. Yeah, see, you see, see, you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. I remember Mike saying, Les, you can do this. Mike, huh? Mike, how, man? Wait a minute, Mike. Uh, how much, how much am I going to be able to to, to, to charge, Mike, less, um, you, you, well, you could start out at $1,000 an hour. Uh, th Mike, I don't make that working for two weeks. Come on, Mike. I, Mike, uh, man, I, I appreciate your belief in me, Mike. Look, Mike, I work for the Miami Sanitation Department. Man, I've, I've been a garbage collector. Uh, uh, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've done door-to-door -door sales. Th that was great, and, you know, I, I'm here as a disc jockey. That's good, Mike, but... Mike, I don't think I can do that less. You can. But Mike, I don't have any credentials. I've never, I've never written any book, anything. Man, I'm, I'm not rich. How can I teach somebody to do something I've never done? But Les, why don't you just test yourself? Why don't you stretch, Les? Come on, man. Mike, I, I don't know. And here's something I, I realized. Write this out. Sometimes... You have to believe in somebody's belief in you until your belief kicks in. I respect 
Mike Williams. Here, this young man, he, he saw something in me that I didn't see it in a in, in strong analytical mind. And I looked at him, I always respected his thinking. And he looked at me and he made me feel special. And I said, okay, Mike. And I just kept holding on to what Mike said to me. I just kept holding on to what Mr. Washington said to me. I kept holding on to my mother saying, you're special, Leslie, when they said you're educable, mentally retarded. Mama didn't know what that meant. She only had a third grade education. So she said, he'll be all right, honey, hard head, make a soft behind, he'll be fine. <laughs> but she said, you're special, baby. You are special. And, and they kept saying that over and over again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. And so here's what I want you to do. Let us say together, as you think about your goals and your dream, let us say together, it's possible together, please. It's possible. Say it like you mean it. It's possible. Thank you. Write that down. See, see, most people never achieve their goals because most people suffer from possibility blindness. They look, about, they look around trying to think about the things that they don't have. Robert Roots, a young man who wrote a book about <laughs> success principles of the three little pigs, he said, it's not what you don't have, it's what you think you need that keeps you from being successful or happy in life. It's not what you don't have. See, I was focused on what I didn't have. Don't have a college degree, don't have any credentials, never worked for a major corporation. I was focused on the negative things. I said, negative things are the things that you see when you're not focused on your goal. What do you come with? What is it that you have within you that you showed up to bring? Hey, Les, you don't know, but my, my dream is a long shot, long shot. A friend of mine, Dexter Yeager, said, when the dream is big enough, the odds don't matter. I'm reminded of a great man when I was reading Time magazine talking about some of the great minds of the last century. They, they didn't mention his name, Dr. Howard Thurman, one of the mentors of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and also an advisor to Mahatma Gandhi and, and Albert Schweitzer. And he said, the ideal situation for a man or woman to die is to have family members standing around their bed praying with them as they cross over. But imagine, if you will, being on your deathbed and standing around your bed, the dreams given to you by life, the ideas that you never acted on, the talents, the gifts, the abilities that you never used. And there they are, standing around your bed, looking at you with large, angry eyes, saying, we came to you, and only you could have given us life. And now we must die with you forever. And the question is, if you died this very moment, what will die with you? What dreams, what ideas, what talents, what leadership potential, what greatness that you showed up to bring, that you allowed fear of procrastination to hold you back? Perhaps that's why Henry David Thoreau wrote the words, Oh God, to reach the point of death, only to realize that you've never lived, only to realize that you've never scraped the surface of your potential. Repeat after me, please, with power, feeling, and conviction. I refuse to die an unlived life. Yes, shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, Live your dream. Yeah, I think we should all resolve. I refuse to die an unlived life. Don't worry about the odds. You survived one out of 40 million sperms. You will never have those odds again. You beat those odds, you can win anything. Here's something else stop most people. You know what it is? Failure. Let us say together, I will fail my way to success. Yes, write that down. I will fail my way to success. See, eight out of 10 millionaires have been financially bankrupt. 85% of people allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. And I believe that the reason that most people um, go so far in life and stop, Maya Angelou said it best. She, she wrote a poem, she said that most people go so far in life and then they park. They pull off the highway of life especially when they get some hits, especially when they've been rejected, especially if they have an illness, especially if they lose something, they, they paw. And, and I take it further. They don't even turn on their emergency lights. It's not because uh, that, that they are broken down. 
They don't want anybody to stop and say, hey, look here, I've got some jumping cables in my trunk. You need, you need a jump? Hey, look here, there's a service station ahead about three or four miles. I have a can. I can take you up there and get some gasoline. Oh, no, I'm just fine. I, I had a talk show once, and highest rated, fastest canceled talk show in the history of television. Well, at least I had one. <laughs> and... And I was excited, at the, the, you know, when the time I came into television um, years ago, it, television was based upon conflict and controversy. So I said, I want a solution-oriented talk show. First concept of that kind, high ratings. And the syndicator said, you just got lucky. Come on, let's do these other type of shows. You can be a, a Jerry Springer. Oh, no, that's not why I came here. No, I, I, I believe that we live in the greatest country in the world where we should hold ourselves to certain standards. I, I'm not going to come here and sell out on who I am. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to lower my standards for you. No, that's not why I showed up. And so they fired me. <laughs> Security walked him out. I said, I can walk by myself. <laughs> but let me tell you what happened. I took a hit and I parked. It wasn't that... I didn't have the ability to do more. I, my concept was good. But what happened when I took the hit, when they canceled the show, I canceled myself. When they said the show is going to be taken off television, it won't work, I told myself, Les, you can't succeed in television. And I parked. You know what I did? I went back to my comfort zone. As a motivational speaker, at least I, I, I'm doing better than most people. That's nothing to compare yourself to worse that other people are doing and then make yourself feel better. No, I parked. I didn't have my emergency lights on. I didn't want to show up on the radar. I parked. You know how long I parked? I parked for 10 years. Do you hear me? Now, unlike Regis Philbin, when his shows were canceled, he kept going. He kept going. He kept going. And he got other shows. I bet you somebody gave him a push. Somebody said, hey, you need a lift. I didn't even make that an option for me. I got off the highway, I went to back to my comfort zone, and I parked. The show failed, and I identified myself as a failure. And guess something happened? One day, just flipping the channels, looking at PBS, and saw Wayne Dyer, my friend Wayne Dyer. And boy, I said, wait, we're both in our 60s. Wayne is still doing it. Wow, the little hair he has, it's great, he's still there. I said, hey, I've got some more stuff in me. I've got another PBS special in me. I've got, I've got some other ideas. You know, Oprah and Phil, they're doing my stuff. Maybe I need to come back out here. And I, and I went back and started calling PBS and, and different people. They said, Les, what happened to you? I said, well, um, I, I didn't know whether or not anybody would be interested in me because the show was canceled. No, no, you had some good ideas. And when they said, yeah, we would love to do a show with you. I said, you what? They said yes, and when I went into the studio, and, and people that worked with 10 years ago, they were still there. And I said, you guys, you know, do you guys still have it? They said, we have it. Do you have it? I said, I think so. <laughs> and I did the show, and I wasn't as good as I was 10 years ago because I was off the highway. I'd gotten off the highway of life. I, I'd been parked for so long, it's taking me some time to get my strength back, to find my power, to get my confidence back. But at least I'm back out there in the game determined to dry empty so i say to you see i only attract millionaires of millionaires in training let's go get that in a minute you have something special you have greatness within you and the only reason you are here you are my assignment you can feel me. Some of you feel me right here in your heart of hearts. And my goal in, is to get past your mind and into your heart. So it's necessary that you, you have the mindset that I can do this. You've got to begin to believe and to fortify that belief and feed that belief by listening to tapes, going to seminars and workshops, by challenging yourself, by stretching yourself. It was Osborne who said, unless you attempt to do something beyond that, which you've already mastered, you will never grow. And, and as you begin to challenge yourself, you'll discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. The other thing is you begin to look at yourself, look at your dreams, and, and, and begin, begin to experiment and stepping into your greatness one of the things that's very important, whatever goals and dreams that you have, repeat after me, please. Make your move before you're ready. 
You have Price Pritchett, who's a great, great motivator and, and, and trainer. He said, make your move before you're ready. We're in, instructed in, in life to walk by faith and not by sight. See, you want to really begin to stretch yourself. You want to become a risk taker. You want to raise the bar on yourself. Most people won't do that. See, most people engage in low life living, low risk living. This God said, if you're not willing to risk, you cannot grow. And if you cannot grow, you cannot become your best. And if you cannot become your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, then what else is there? I like what Helen Keller said, life is short and unpredictable. Eat the dessert first. <laughs> and so you want to begin to take some chances. You want to begin to challenge yourself and make it okay to fail and learn from your failures. Don't allow fear of failure and the, the, the allure, the attractiveness of playing it safe in life to draw you in. You can't get out of life alive. You've got to die to leave here. What would you say to anyone? Do you have any, like, let's say steps or just some nuggets that you can share if you, there's someone out there that's listening, that's trying to achieve a goal? What are some of your steps to achieving goals? Well, if we look at where we are today, because things have changed dramatically from when you read Live Your Dreams in 1992. Uh, I've just completed my new book called You Gotta Be Hungry. Oh, and awesome. Yes, you gotta be hungry, at least you'll break this. And so when you said that today, I just cracked up. I said, oh my God, that means I'm on the right path. <laughs> so the, 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 the key to it today is one is the kind of platform that you've established mindset transformation mm -hmm. as the man think it so is he as he continues to think so he remains dr carter g woodson said if you can determine what a man shall think you never have to concern yourself with what he will do he said that if you can make a man feel inferior you never have to compel him to seek an inferior status for he will seek it himself and if you can make a man feel justly an outcast, you never have to order him to go to the back door. You go without being told. And if there's no door, his very nature will demand one. And so mindset transformation, it's an ongoing process. The next thing that's very important is to upgrade your skill set. And that this is the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. So you want to find at least three areas that you master, that you do that extremely well. I train speakers how to tell their story. And so I can teach them how to become a global voice. And in addition to speaking and training speakers, I also know how to tell a story. I know how to present with power. I know how to speak with my power voice. I've had a training coming up in, in December called Discover Your Power Voice and Master Your Cash Flow. So by my speaking and my training speakers, and the next thing that I'm able to do, I can sell a, a product, I can sell a concept. I used to be a salesperson for Sears. And so through my skills as a speaker, as a trainer of speakers, and as a person who can sell presentation power to make a point to bring out the best in people or to sell a product. Those are three areas that allows me to control my personal economy. So the average person, if they are serious about learning how to control their destiny and controlling their own personal economy, they have to be in, engaged in continuous ongoing processes to upgrade their knowledge and their skills. Knowledge is the new currency. Mm -hmm. We're going toward a time that's called the end of work, that because of technology, over 20,000 jobs, according to the Department of Labor, being lost every day. So we're going toward a time where the majority of that jobs will be done by artificial intelligence or robots, and that's not too far away. So the key is that as you look at yourself, look at your goals and dreams, Work on your mindset continuously, which will give you the courage and the mental resiliency to weather the stormy times that we're going to go through in life invariably. Continuously expand your skill set. Robert Shula said, you either expand or you are expendable. Right. And create a community of collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships. By doing that, collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships 
whatever goals that you have, you can reach a minimum of 87% of those goals by transforming your mindset, increasing your skill set, and having a team of collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships. Wow, that's really good. That's really good. So you're spending most of your time, is, it, is that what I'm hearing you say? You're teaching other people how to yes, grow their yes. platform? I train people who are serious. I don't work with everybody. I'm not interested. I'm 74, you know? So with the time that I have left, I want to work with people that are hungry. <laughs> hungry. There's something in you that says that you're not sitting back waiting to see what politicians will do for you. There's something in you that says, I'm not going to focus on the general economy. I'm going to focus on my personal economy. There's something in you that says the most dependable hand in the world is the one at the end of your risk. There's something in you that says always strive to get on top in life because it's the bottom that's overcrowded. You are different. You have greatness within you. Dr. Howard Thurman, come forth, is a man that after having 238 radiation seed implants and my PSA continued to increase, in fact, Last year, this time, was over 1,500. And, and the little C cancer had eaten 40% of my T1 vertebrae. And I was reading his words that night after leaving Florida Hospital, and the doctors had told me that cancer had re reappeared. It metastasized in eight areas of my body. And I began to laugh as the doctor spoke to me. And he was looking real serious. He said, why are you laughing? I said, I feel like Mother Teresa. He said, what do you mean? She said, Lord, I know you know how much I can bear. I wish you didn't have so much confidence in me. <laughs> and now my PSA is 0, 0.0. I'm debt free, cancer free. Yes, indeed. I stand before you because of God's grace and mercy. And trust me, it's better to be seen than to be viewed. <laughs> <laughs> but Dr. Thurman was called upon by Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. He said, Howard, I want you to mentor my boy, MLK. He was a member of an elite group of orators and mystics and philosophers in his day. He, he was an advisor to Mahatma Gandhi, to Abbott Schweitzer. He wrote, Deep is the Hunger, the Voice of the Genuine, the Centering Moment. He wrote some words that I was reading around 3 o'clock in the morning that grabbed me. He said, the ideal situation for a man or woman to die is to have family members praying with them as they cross over. He said, but imagine being on your deathbed and standing around your bed, the ghost of the dreams, the ideas, the abilities, the talents, given to you by life, but you, for whatever reason, you never pursued those dreams. You never used those talents. You never used those gifts. You never used those abilities. And there they are standing around your bed looking at you with large angry eyes saying, we came to you and only you could have given us life. And now we must die with you forever. And the question is, if you died today, what dreams, what ideas, what books, what leadership, what voice, what story will die with you? Miles Monroe, great speaker out of the Bahamas, said, the wealthiest place on the planet is not in the Four East where there's oil in the ground. It's not in South Africa where there are diamond mines. He said, the wealthiest place on the planet is the... There you'll find potential never realized. There you'll find books never written. There you find abilities and skills and talents and gifts the world never had an exposure to. Maybe that's why Henry David Thoreau asked in a moment of anguish, what if you live your whole life only to discover that it was wrong? That it was wrong. God had so much more in mind for you. Maybe that's, that's, that's why he said, oh God, to reach the point of death only to realize that you've never lived only to realize that you've never scraped the surface of your potential. Everybody let us say together, live full, die empty. 
And the people in this room have decided to live full. The people in this room have decided to die empty. The people in this room have decided to live life on their terms and not to be a volunteer victim. When you say yes to this industry, you're saying yes for a bigger life. You're saying yes, I'm tired of playing small. You're saying yes, I'm really too ready to be empowered to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. You're saying yes to providing for yourself and your family. There's something that's in you that says I'm not mentally fit to work for somebody for the rest of my life. You're saying yes to your life, yes to your dreams, yes to your unfolding future. Give yourselves a round of applause. Give yourself a round of applause. I didn't do this for years. I would go in the balcony of auditoriums and watch Jim Rohn, and Dr. Dennis Waitley, and Zig Ziglar. And my heart would beat so fast because I love helping people. How many love helping people? Raise your hands. I love helping people. And my heart said, I can do that. But then when I would leave there, and, I, and as I was walking to the car, my mental conditioning began to speak. And it would say, Les Brown, you can't do that. You don't have a college education. Les Brown, you can't do that. What makes you think that you have something to say that somebody would listen to you? Les Brown, you can't do that. What makes you think that you can speak for AT&T, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's Corporation, IBM? You've never worked for a major corporation. Les Brown, you can't do that. You were adopted. You don't even know who your parents are. How many of you ever thought about something you wanted to do? You felt it in your heart, and then your mind talked you out of it. Raise your hands, please. I convinced myself that I couldn't do it. I learned something from that experience. Whenever there's an argument between your heart and your mind, follow your heart. The things that the heart can understand and feel that the mind cannot relate to. Maybe that's why my favorite book says, Lean not unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. There are things that you feel, that you know in your heart of hearts, that's not logical, it's not practical, it's not realistic, but there's something in you that says, I can do this. I can do this. After facing defeats and disappointments and failures again and again and again, there's still something in you that says, I can do this. Operating out of a thinking when life knocks you down, try and land on your back because when you can look up, you can get up. I can do this. I can do this. When you present and, and people say, oh yes, I'd like to be a part of that. Yes. They have the personality and they need it and they don't show up. You end up being a babysitter. You have to be a counselor and a psychologist and a minister. They challenge you. Pray to Jesus and Yahweh and Melchizedek and Buddha. They have get on your last nerve, have you chanting, Nomi Yoho Renge Kyo. <laughs> it's interesting when you talk to people about securing their future and you can't help them to become actively engaged in their own life. A friend of mine named Lorraine had me to come to do an intervention with her brother that was addicted to drugs and, and he told us to get out of his house. And as we were going down the steps, I said, I'm sorry I failed. I, I, I'm so disappointed. And she said something that I'll never forget, I want you to remember. She said, Les, most people won't participate in their own rescue. Most people won't participate in their own rescue. You have a, a vehicle that will allow them to create their own job. You have products that people need. 
you have training and coaching where they're being business for themselves but not by themselves you have leadership of people who've proven that it's possible you can live your dreams it's possible you got a shot at creating a fortune everybody's not going to do it we can't predict performance and all you are saying hey listen here's an opportunity and don't take it personal when people say no to you they're not saying no to you they're saying no to themselves they're saying no to living a bigger life they're saying no to what's going on in their head because they're suffering from possibility blindness they can't see themselves doing more they don't want to do that extra work so they're saving you some time they know they are trifling and don't want to work don't try and convince them to say yes a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still this is hard work h a r d and h e a r t hard work and hard work you got to gut this out you've got to make know your vitamin you've got to fail your way to success you've got to be unstoppable you have to operate like willy jolly who said a setback is a setup for a comeback you've got to be relentless when you're building a business you got to be able to have courage after you face rejection and again and again and again after somebody tell you they're going to show up and then they don't come they don't return your calls it takes courage to go out and start talking to people it takes courage when creditors are bill a breathing down your neck and family members say oh there he goes again with another pyramid scheme Am I making sense to you? What I'm doing. I didn't do this for 14 years because I didn't have the courage. I was afraid of being rejected because I don't have a college education. I had a tremendous inferiority complex and something else. In order to make this business successful, it go from a 9 to 5 to five and tell you faint it's a different mindset it requires a radical change how many of you know that it's hard building a thriving residual income on a monthly basis raise your hands please yeah that's why most people won't say yes it's much easier to complain about the economy it's much easier to complain about our elected officials It's much easier to talk about the recession. That's much easier to come up with excuses. And why you can't do it? That's where I was. That's where I set up station for a long time. My mentor said something to me, Mike Williams. I want you to write this down. He said anybody can complain. He said if you do what is easy, that's complaining. If you do what is easy, your life will be hard. But if you do what is hard, your life will be easy. Come on now. That's strong medicine. If you do what is easy, complain about your situation, your circumstances. If you do what is easy, stand around and be a volunteer victim like everybody else. If you do what is easy, surrender and give up on your dreams become depressed and bitter and angry anybody can do that if you do what is easy your life will be hard but if you do what is hard keep coming back again and again and again if you do what is hard approaching strangers talking to people in shopping malls get up dressed every day going out prospecting knowing some way somehow with a spirit of expectation somebody's out here looking for an opportunity you can go outside right now and see some pigeons but you're out hunting for eagles and they are not common and if you do that over and over and over again somebody's going to show up somebody's going to say i'm the one
Dr. Thurman, I love him so much. What a great writer. He said, there's something in each and every one of you that waits and listens to the voice of the genuine in yourself. It will be perhaps the only guide you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, all of your life, your days will be spent on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. And I submit to you that you invested the time and money to go to the airport, to fly cross country. I suggest to you, some of you drove here. I suggest to you, you showed up because you said, I'm going to pull my own strings. I'm going to control my own life. Nobody will ever pull my strings again. Give yourselves a round of applause. Let's, where do we go to get that energy we need and that fo to, to keep our focus and to keep our drive? Whenever you're moving from one level to the other and you have to reinvent yourself, the adjustment, it's very, very difficult, it's very, very challenging. And I think that you need to begin to remind yourself of your why. You know, Nietzsche said, if you know the why for living, if you know why you're doing something, it will empower you to endure anything that you're going through. When you're working in corporations, you're working in financial services, it's a very competitive area, it's very, very dynamic. It's, this is the era that Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. And so people are tensed and, and very, very stressed out. So how do you deal with that? And, and knowing why you do what it is that you do. The name of the game right now is perceptual and psychological. It's the mental adjustments that we must make in the midst of the difficulties. That's what leaders do. Leaders don't panic. They are not intimidated by the change. They're not intimidated by the difficulties. What they are, they are empowered by it. I remember reading something that has said, says not what you don't have is what you think you need that keeps you from handling the difficulties and the challenges of life. And we have everything we need within us to face and to deal with whatever we have at, at, at hand because we are more powerful than anything that we're up against. Now these mental adjustments and this uh this idea that I've got what I need, I mean, in some ways that represents who I am. For many years, I was living a life that I was not designed to do. I'm designed to speak, that's what I do. But for 42 years, I'm 62 now, for 42 years, I was doing something I wasn't designed to do because when I looked at what I wanted to do, that was to speak, to train, to empower people, that my inner conversation to myself was, Les Brown, you can't do that. You were labeled educable mental retarded in the fifth grade. You have no college training. You were born in an abandoned building on a floor. You don't even know your birth parents. You can't do that. You are DT. You were called the dumb twin. Those words became my reality for many years. And then someone came along and interrupted that conversation in my head and said, Mr. Brown, they tell me you're about to drop out of school. And, and I said, um, well, yes, why, I, I, I just, I can't, I'm not smart like my brother. And I'll never forget when we first met, I was in his class waiting on another student. And he came in and said, young man, go to this board and work this problem out for me. I said, sir, I can't do that. I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter. Follow my directions anyhow. And I said, I can't, sir. And he said, why? I said, sir, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. So now this man changed how I saw myself. When I saw myself as the dumb twin, and that was the conversation in my head that was given to me. That's what I believed. I accepted that. So the things that I was up against academically, they began to appear not as difficult as I thought they were because now he empowered me. Before then, right before then, up to that point, the things that were placed before me, I would stumble, I would slow the class down because I was convinced that I was dumb. I believe what they said to me. And this guy came along and he changed my perception of myself. Someone said that people don't live life as it is. They live life as they are. And so what we have to do as leaders, I don't care where you are in customer service, managing people, that you have to do during the tough times, you have to bring the best out of you. You can either live your dreams or live your fears. And I think the majority of people actually are not living their dreams, but are living their fears. So I want to ask you a question. What are your fears? What are you afraid of? What are you scared of?
because we all have fears, don't we? We all have something that's blocking us, that's holding us back. And as we begin to look at life, what we realize is that the reason that most people are not living out their true potential and not doing all of the things that they would really like to do is because of fear. Some people call fear false evidence or expectations appearing real. I'm reminded of the story of um, a guy that was living in an area where he had some new neighbors and these neighbors had a bulldog. And when he came home every day, this bulldog used to chase him about a half a block from his house every day. He would have to streak home. I mean, he would just run. This bulldog would be right on his heels. And so he just got tired of that because he would go home about a half a block away from home. He would look around for this bulldog and he would see him. And he would go walking casually along and this bulldog come out of nowhere woo, 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 and start chasing him. He'd run home. So this one day he just got tired. And so when the bulldog was running after him, he started running, he saw a rock and he stopped to pick it up to throw at the bulldog. And when the bulldog got up on him, he started barking, he realized the bulldog didn't have any teeth in his mouth. <laughs> then he started chasing the bulldog, if you don't get all the way from it. Because <laughs> the most the bulldog could have done is gum, you know. <laughs> and so, you know what? Most people go through life running scared running scared from things that have no teeth in them because they're false expectations appearing real. Let's see, we're brilliant enough to scare ourselves to death. You realize that? There are some people actually who get a kick out of scaring themselves to death. I remember the last frightening movie I saw. It was The Exorcist. I will never forget. I was so frightened when I came home. I'll never forget, I drove in the driveway and I had already called my former wife and said, listen, turn the lights on. <laughs> I was coming in the driveway and I, and I was getting out of the car and all of a sudden I couldn't get out. I started blowing my horn. I said, Madeline, they got me, they got me. <laughs> she came to the kitchen with and said, take your seatbelt loose, fool. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, okay, okay. I was frightened out of my wits. But there are a lot of people who they get off on that. They love I'm a person that, I, I, my brother is a paratrooper. My twin brother, he's in the military, a career man. I would love to jump out of an airplane to parachute. I'm scared though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really admire my brother for that. I would really love to be macho man like that. What are the things that you fear that's been keeping you from living your dream? That's been keeping you from doing some things that you would like to do? Just think about those things. And how do we begin to handle that? Abraham Maslow said that the life is about growth. And he said, you can either go back to your comfort zone, and there you won't find any growth, or you must willing, be willing to go forward and face your fears again and again and again. Because you're never going to have a, a fear-free existence. I mean, some fear is acceptable and legitimate. There are some things that you, you really should be afraid of. Now, you shouldn't allow it to immobilize you. You acknowledge it, you take it into account, and you carry yourself accordingly. There are times that we should proceed with caution, but it's the difference between being stopped by fear. It's the difference between having a fear and the fear having you. So what do we do? One, acknowledge it, and knowing that it's okay. Don't condemn yourself for being afraid. It's perfectly fine to have some fears. You acknowledge your fears, you embrace those fears, and then you move on. You act on whatever it is that you fear. Because once you embrace it, see, what you resist will persist. What you resist will persist. So one of the most important things is, is to begin to embrace your fears.